No? Good morning, everyone, and <laughs> welcome. Uh, I want to introduce uh, this morning's speaker, Tim Davis, uh, RN and BSN from Grandview. Uh, Tim has been here at Mary Greeley for, in the cath lab since 2005 and an Air Force flight nurse since 2010 and in the military for 18 years. Tim is talking to us today about his recent deployment to Afghanistan from September 2012 to January 2013. So, very proud and happy to call Tim my coworker and friend. So, welcome. Thank you, Carrie, and uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy day. I hope I am talented enough to run the clicker and the mic, so we'll see how it goes. But, uh, no, happy Nurses Week to everybody. Um, it's a special time. We should be noticed because we work, you know, we do well or uh, help patients every day. So a little aspect background on me, um, my full-time job is down at the cath lab, but my quote part-time job slash full-time job is uh, doing Air, uh, Air Force flight nursing up in Minneapolis. So it gets a little busy at times, but like Carrie said, I was deployed. And I was gonna do, kind of do you uh, or tell a couple things uh, before I get started is um, the history of flight nursing in the military um, started they knew after World War I, a lot of people injured or died because they couldn't get air evac or taken to the hospital for immediate care. So after, by 1942, there's a handout I brought in. The first class of flight nurses was uh, um, brought in during World War II uh, around November 1942. So you think about it, the technology, the planes, but you still had, at that point, women raising their hand pretty much as a volunteer to fly in the danger zone to, to grab men and soldiers and bring them back to uh, the care they needed. So they risked their lives uh, and gave a lot, a lot of them sacrificed during this time. So uh, the plan, they had the need, they trained them up, and they went to war basically. So you put that in your mind in 1942. We all know about Germany and the invasion and all that. So. so there's the handout talks about a couple of these nurses that um, actually lost their life. Um, they were shot down. They didn't use the Red Cross on planes, so they were combatants. So if the nurses were riding on the plane, you know, if they went down, uh, they were captured like everybody else. And, and uh, so the need was there. And I think the last paragraph talks about uh, 500 nurses um, during World War II, and they evac air evac over uh, almost uh, over a million uh, soldiers. So and 17 nurses during that time lost their life during the war. So a little background. So fast forward, and I'm going to come out here so I can see what I'm okay, doing here. So how I got into this, uh, I was an Army nurse for about 15 years, and uh, there was a need for flight nurses, so I applied. And the closest uh, air vac base is Minneapolis, so I go up there and, and train up there. So, uh, so it is a lot of training. We talk about, everybody knows pilots fly the plane, but the nurses and the med techs are on the back. So, you know, we, uh, we set up shop back there and we all get on the same page before we do a flight, if we're taking patients somewhere or uh, bringing them back. But you always brief as a group, the med side, the, the techs and nurses, and then you get onto the plane and talk with the pilots and the load masters. And I'll get into that pretty quick, but, so you're on the same page initially so um, you work on this team because that aircraft, you know, locks up and you're on your way out. So, so I went to the Middle East last fall, and uh, I was the only one from Minneapolis that went downrange to that spot, which I don't know if anybody's been to the Middle East, but September is super hot, like 125 degrees and no shade, trust me, and you'll see pictures of this. So I brought a few pictures in, and then at the end, I know people have to get back to work, there's an eight-minute video. It has my boss on there, so, and uh, it was on one of the cable networks. So, uh, I'll show that at the end. So, if you need to leave after the slide and the video, by all means, do so. So, so I'll show you. This is kind of the region of Europe, and uh, to get there, um, we all meet up. Once you're deployed, you meet up on these coasts. You fly to Germany, which is. 
a pointer up in the left hand corner and then it's nine hour uh, difference in the from central time to to Qatar Q A T A R which I'll just come point to it's so small it's sitting right there but it's the richest country in the world and it's mainly from oil is is what they are but we have an Air Force base there that's where I lived for four months so if you see Germany and you come all the way down to that point I just showed is about a seven hour flight so we would run patients up there you know if anybody remembers last fall's news um, there was a lot going on in the Middle East and there always is Iran um, Iraq's right there I'll point this out this is Kuwait right here so this whole region is obviously very volatile and um, we get calls uh, to go to places to get people they can be military civilians government contractors wherever they fit in the system we just we're kind of like being on call we get paged and we go to uh, the aircraft and go to these places what's interesting is if you look to the right there Iran's right there the shortcut between Qatar to Afghanistan be straight over the Gulf into Afghanistan but that's not going to happen in today's world so we would have to fly and I'll point this out one time we'd go from here up to the Pakistan border and you have Kandahar and Bagram um, in Afghanistan that's where the biggest need for our skills were for medevac so uh, and usually like 46 hours so it's a long day if you think about getting up early um, getting your gear on the plane and going down range Sometimes you have time to take a nap, sometimes you don't. Sometimes uh, you're doing other things, getting things ready. And uh, you land, and the nurses, the medical treatment facility will bring the patients to us, and uh, we'll load up and go back to where we need to go. Either Usually Qatar, where I was at, the QD level where I was at was uh, um, a lot of mental health, uh, hernias, torn ACL, ACLs, and uh, some neuro stuff they had to bring be brought back to Qatar we had doctors there that could either uh, evaluate and treat there or we'd run them to Germany where I was at we had four teams and I'll show you we rotated who was going to fly that week and I'll just get into specific this is what you live in over there it looks kind of bland I know and it is <laughs> and there's no tr there's no shade it gets very hot there so these are trailers. Um, if you're lucky, which I was, get your own little mini rooms, kind of like a dorm room. And I think it's going to come up here. Oh, that's just a close-up view. So the the med that wood bench we had medical evac on there. So that was our front door. And if you was lucky enough to get a bicycle for transportation, that was always. And I bought one when I was there. I used one. And but the heat is so intense over there that it's. Uh, we did a lot of night missions because it's. it's uh, a lot easier on our patients say September through November and then um, we start doing night or day missions like in December when it start cooling down to 90 or so that's kind of my room um, a lot of hand-me-downs people rotate in now there so if you see like mirrors I didn't take, bring that mirror there's stuff there that's left and you just recycle stuff and it's like a garage sale <laughs> so we do a lot of that um, this is me and uh, my crew the whole time over there. To the left, um, he was an Air Force Reserve guy from California. Of course, you see me. Um, the girl in front was active duty. Met, uh, usually fly with a basic crew. I should have told you that before. Myself as a nurse and Josh, the man with the white belt on on the right, was the other nurse. And you have three medical technicians, like paramedic types, uh, EMT types medical trained you work as a team you're usually a nurse in charge and one of the uh, medical technicians in charge on the aircraft and even though you work and brief as a team maybe a decision or something needs to be finalized the nurse normally says what to do but you work as a team like anywhere other facility and and work as a team just to get the mission accomplished but typical gray or excuse me brown flight suits um, April's wearing that she was active duty and that was a new flight suit and green doesn't really fit the desert but 
The nice thing about it is two piece, so when it's super hot over there, you can take the top off, wear a t shirt, wear the flight suits. We have t shirts underneath, but you're not allowed to unzip and tie because it's a hazard. So that's what she was one of the first ones that had that, so that's why she kind of stuck out. So, like I said, two nurses and three uh, medical technicians. That's the inside of a 17. You see cargo around us, that was pretty typical. That's a C 17. C stands for cargo. This plane is a Cadillac. It's not like a commercial airplane. Um, the seats aren't that great, but it really is an amazing machine. It can take off in dirt runways. It can back up if it needs to. Um, and it's uh, pretty comfortable for patients and, and uh, people who fly in, the, in the, uh, the back of it. We wear headsets when we work on the aircraft, so it's so loud. And uh, I guess before my time, they used to not they had earplugs in and then they, they would uh, scream at each other so if somebody was down at the end of there it, it just their hand signals so Bose company has a, a, a noise counseling um, headset that we use and you just press the talk it's similar to one we're in now but you can talk to the patients if you ask them about something the patient and uh, they can't hear you so the patients can't hear you they have earplugs in but so it's a nice tool but that was a, one of the nicer planes that we flew on so that's actually inside the plane. The floor is slick. The equipment on my left, um, your right, is what we carried all the time with us. Those stairs going up there goes to the, the front end of the cockpit, and the pilots and the navigators were set up there, and they got two peepholes they can look out. But nurses and techs, we're allowed to go up there, you know, if we need to go either ask a question or, or just look out the window and uh, take a little break. But that's typical. That's, that's my work clothes right there, basically. This is Bahrain at night. We got a call. My team was on call, basically, and um, if there's something urgent um, or priority patient, this was a, a preemie baby, three pounds. And you're asking, why are the military flying a baby that small or a baby at all? The parents were um, a government contractor, had been at this naval base, and this baby needed to go to Germany. So thank goodness I didn't have to take care of a NICU baby, but the long story short, we're uh, what I do are in charge of the equipment getting the plane ready. So that's a little incubator there. That green thing there is the oxygen. The seats on these planes face in and we just set this up. It's a huge plane for this mission but it's the closest one and most avail available one to us to come get us. It's at night. I think it's like midnight. This gentleman here is helping coordinate with me to get the baby here and of course they were late because ambulance but the baby need to go to Germany for uh, for the care. There's a NICU team that came down, a doctor, a respiratory therapist, and a, uh, a nurse that met us there. So we all came together and took that baby to Germany. A little fuzzy here. can get pretty tight on these planes. Um, a lot of these guys haul these cargo. I think that's a plane engine there in that do not drop container. <laughs> so don't drop that. But um, so it get packed, and, and there's special rules to all this. If, if we don't have patients, it can get crowded like this, but if we have patients, they have to give us room to work. And the rear is on the right side, and their cargo is on the left. But it was always uh, pretty much an order given to us. Everything has to go. If the plane can handle it, get the, everybody on that plane. And as long as it's safe. safe, safety is number one. And what's interesting about me speaking today, in the last week or two, there's been a couple of plane crashes over there. And I think after seeing these pictures, it'll make sense to you. It can get bumpy and things, and <laughs> I'm older now, but there's some young pilots. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> you wonder if they should be driving a car, let alone a, uh, something like this. But you got to trust in them like they trust in, our patients trust in us. So I'll just say that. Um, and they're really good if the pilot, if there's radio, um, there's a... Uh, plane lanes, like they fly, so another pilot will talk to a pilot, say, hey, it's bumpy here, it's choppy, be ready. So they tell us to get patients secured, and, and, uh, and we do. And they're supposed to wear their seat belt when they're not, uh, when they're sitting down. They can go to the bathroom, of course, but uh, um, they should be wearing their seat belt, just like a car. But this will make sense to you. So the plane crash, it, I think everybody's aware of it, there's a plane crash that was carrying a lot of this stuff. It was a civilian aircraft, but it took off. My understanding, I don't think reports out yet, 
something came unloose. So if you see the video, the plane rocks back. They're not very hot off the ground. So they think something heavy rolled back and then shot forward and it pushed the plane down. So the pilot, sad story, couldn't pull up. They didn't have enough room, you know, enough elevation. So they, and they were all killed. So there's a lot of weight. And you're going to see a couple pictures here. It's like, how does that plane get off the ground? And I wonder it too, but it does. Um, and there was another refueler that we fly on. We did not in the desert, but crashed this week. And uh, to be honest, it's pretty safe, but just that we had two crashes, one was military, one civilian doing the same thing in the, in the military, um, ha hauling cargo. I mean, they haul everything. So that's typical. That's the C-17. It's really big. My guys are on the right. All that stuff strapped down is equipment they, that we have to carry some way. Usually we get ground support that helps us. Um, uh, we put in the back of pickup vans to get our equipment to and from um, where we need to go. All that stuff on the left is on rollers, and there's people in the back of that plane uh, called load masters, and they are in charge of that cargo. So they tie everything down. But if we had to, we could put patients on that right side, and it's wider than it looks there. But um, that's what kind of what it looks like. It's not a luxury, ve uh, luxury vehicle, so you just strap in. It's interesting about this. There's another plane we fly. It's called C-17, or excuse me, C-130. It has propellers. It's a workhorse, kind of like an old Jeep. It's been around forever, and even the Vietnam ones are still out there. They, they just um, uh, recondition them, you know, to keep the maintenance up on them. What's interesting about this picture is this is Kuwait. And we're not allowed to take pictures of the flight line, but I squatted down and took that out. That is a, um, uh, um, let's say, for, for, for planes. Um, I can't train a thought here. So 20, 20 years ago, a hangar, thank you. Uh, they parked planes, and you kind of see the cutout for the tail. When uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait 20 years ago, uh, we came with our jets and bombed those because the Iraqi army had their planes in there, so we took those, um, th those buildings out. 20 years after this, the French build them, and the Kuwait is suing the French because they're destroyed. You can't really tell, but they're destroyed there. And they said, we didn't get here against the U.S., so the, the bombs were just high-tech and took them all out, and the Kuwaitis are still not happy about that. But I thought it was interesting. 20 years, it's still there, and there's a bunch of them like that, so we'll move on. I'm six foot three. This is what these planes carry. That tire is above my waist, and that is a huge, heavy machine, and that's what these planes can carry. So it gives you an idea of the weight on, in these planes. Um, patience, I think my hip is okay here. Long flights, we pre-medicate or medicate uh, pain and comfort. Well, I'm comfortable for these rides. At a couple hours, we like them up, move them around, so there's no risk for DVT. Some of these flights are seven hours. They're dehydrated a lot of times, so we just get them moving. But if we find uh, um, some litters, we put them on and let them nap. And these are some uh, patients going for uh, treatment downrange or when we picked up. You can see the cargo in the back, <laughs> and at this point, they don't care. They just want a place to lay, and they're happy they're going getting help for whatever their injury might be. And it's our job to make sure they're safe getting there. And... Um, you know, keep their pain under control. Uh, they are on. This man here on the right is on a litter. We have, if they can't walk, they have to be um, litter patients laying down. We have a system that we can rack and stack them, and they're about uh, 24 inches apart. We can squeeze them 18, but some of these guys are, you know, you get some Army guys and Marine guys are huge. So they'll hold up to 350 pounds. Um, I didn't see anybody that. I did see one bodybuilder that looked near three, I mean, he was all muscle, and, uh, but he, he didn't have to have a litter, he was ambulatory, so. Uh, but like I said, we had blankets, make them comfortable. It does get cold back there. They can kind of control the temperature, but main thing is just make them comfortable. And if we didn't have enough litters, we'd let some guy nap for a couple, and females too, we had everybody. Okay, next guy gets a nap, so you take the chair. And everybody, we didn't have any trouble. That's the one, uh, C-130, this is why I fly out in Minneapolis. It can, you know, fly on dust. It's, uh, it's just a workhorse, and that's why they keep them around. Noisy, very noisy. But generals, everybody flies on those things, so. 
Okay, right there. This is Afghanistan. This is where people are, and uh, mountainy, cold, can be hot, no trees, and uh, rugged, rugged. I, um, when I got in that country, Qatar, I was thinking, man, this heat is just terrible. But when you start hindsight, when you see where Marines go, you know, foxholes and stuff like that, you appreciate what you have. Like I got a shower, it wasn't the best shower, but they don't get showered there sometimes. So, and they're, a lot of them are young. So, um, this is a neat picture in Afghanistan because you see the desert, orange going up through there, and there's a river, and then it goes to mountains. So, imagine hiking around in that uh, place. This is the smallest plane um, we take. It's, a, it's called a C-21. It's small. It's a jet. You can get one or two patients on there. Um, like I said, my head's about the top. Um, and we, you take one nurse and one medical technician. That's all you have room for. We need to lay them down. We can do our ACLS protocol on the left side. And there's a couple seats. I got one in front of me that's laying down. But uh, uh, it's tight, but it's fast. And there's windows you can see. <laughs> and uh, there's only two pilots. So it's just, you know, you just, uh, it's pretty smooth. And there's one thing about that plane. It's uh, the pilots, ne once they set in it, they never get up. They're, st they're in that seat till that plane stops. <laughs> So it's so tight up there. This is coming into Qatar. This is kind of a typical Middle East. Um, there's a few bunkers for aircraft and things, but pretty much out in the open. And uh, it's hot, very hot. I got to meet a few uh, uh, airplane mechanics, and they lose 40 pounds. They're out there in the heat, and there's safety concerns. They come in an hour, drink. But they drink, drink, drink all day and not go to the bathroom because they just it's that dry, and they'd lose weight, and uh, I just, it's a, it's a tough job, tough job. Um, this is Afghanistan. Uh, those are a couple medical support trucks. You know, it's kind of wild west out there. You don't have the nice fancy stuff. If you can get a trucks, they got dents and things. We put red crosses on them. When we land in places, there's usually a ground crew that come help us. You know, the ambulance or an bus would come out and get our patients. Nurses give report. If then we, if we're staying there or traveling on, we're just looking for a truck or something to throw our equipment into to to keep moving. This was uh, the medical um, compound kind of. It wasn't the clinic, but it was a place where we're considered flyers. So our, we would stow our uh, medical equipment in this big garage. What's unique about that picture there is there were about 15. I was in the basement um, doing some, and these. About 15 Af Afghani boys came through with security detail, and we had an interpreter, and uh, they're bringing that younger generation through to see that it's not all against harm. It's we're here to help that type of thing, kind of PR. Had questions. They had to use English to ask the questions, so they had been working on their English. So it was kind of kind of nice. And I just snapped that. It's uh, it's still a dangerous part in the world, and uh, I think. Our job, our, the, the next generation needs education, and um, all Americans aren't bad type of thing. They're trying to um, ease things, not get into the politics, but just trying to show, you know, we're here to help people as well. And they had questions about all sorts of stuff. And then they're just taking them out to the plane, um, to show them the plane. And, and, uh, but uh, they did need security detail because uh, you never know. Sometimes. Uh, can I stop here? It's the mission. It's knowing that the guy on the ground out That's there, fine. or gal on the ground, is waiting for us. This. This keeps us going. Video, and and it's tough because we can't save them all. And we haven't saved them all. And, uh, uh, and, and my folks have seen some horrendous an stuff since the they've been here. And, uh, and it will be with them for the rest of their lives. In the 10 years that have encompassed the Iraq and Afghanistan military campaigns, tens of thousands of soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen have been taken off the battlefield, flown out of harm's way, and into the care of doctors and nurses who have redefined combat trauma medicine. They've been ferried out of the battle theaters on military aircraft that have been reconfigured into flying trauma wards, 35,000 sorties into and out of the combat theater in the last decade. Mission after mission, deployment after deployment, war-weary doctors, nurses, and flight crews, 
pushed to their physical and emotional limits. You do not have time to cry. This is my you do box. not have time to feel. You basically put those feelings in a box and you put them over here on the counter. The aeromedical crews, many of the reservists or members of the National Guard, fly to Ramstein, Germany from bases in the U.S. and then spend weeks flying downrange to pick up the injured. Mindful of the threat of missile strikes from the ground, on this night, we make a serpentine, lights out combat approach over the towering Hindu Kush mountains, steeply diving to the fog shrouded runway at Bagram, Afghanistan. 100. It is a stomach dropping experience. 50. 30. Colonel Aaron Evangelisti is the commander of the Phoenix crew. What is amazing to see is the selflessness of some of these folks. You know, our, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines that, that we bring on board the airplane, uh, you know, even some of the most critically wounded, you know, you, you can see how, how proud they are for what they've done, what, they, what they've given to their country. At the same time, you, you can see, you know, the, the pain and suffering they're currently, uh, currently going through. On each flight, there are stunning portraits of courage and toughness. The Marine, who refused a stretcher on the seven-hour flight from Balad, Iraq, back to Germany. The survivor of an IED attack that killed members of his platoon. So the back of the ear. I got a hole the size of a golf ball in my arm and strapped on my leg. Other than that, I'm good. The Humvee turret gunner, like most of the severely injured, he too the victim of an IED attack on his vehicle. Like entering into the gates of hell. So you see nothing but blood and glass and, and flames shooting over you. Um, there's a little piece on the turret that basically saved my life. And at that time, you just realize that I don't know if I'm going to survive this. And these are kids, and that's what got yeah. me on a few of these. Yeah. You look in there, so young. They are. But you know what? They, um, they're so resilient. You would be amazed at the, the folks that say, when am I going to get better? I need to get back to my men and women. I need to get back to my troops. The camaraderie here, the dedication is phenomenal. And they want to know, how, how long is it going to take me to get better? I've got to get back to my men. For 19 years, Lieutenant Colonel Sherry Hemby has been the first face that severely injured have seen when they're transitioned out of the war zone. It's a role she says she was born to play. I've always had this wanderlust about me. As a little girl, I used to look at the airplanes and wonder, where were they going? Who was in them? I went to nursing school. After nursing school, I wanted to go active duty. My mother said, oh, no, honey, you can't do that. They'll take you away, and I'll never see you again. She's taken hundreds of flights downrange, cared for thousands of patients. The pressure, she says, takes a toll. We do hurt. We do feel. We see these young men and young women, and we see what war has done to them, and, and, it, and it's hard. We do kind of silly things. I had a water bloom fight for my folks on Memorial Day. I have hula hoops. It kind of helps us to release that steam. As Iraq casualties have wound down, the number of Afghanistan injured has soared. We walk through the sprawling base at Bagram with a colonel who oversees the surging tide of severely injured U.S. and Afghan combatants. We average about 300 traumas in a month, average of about 6 to 10 a day. Since January, we have seen close to 5,000 ER patients roll through the trauma bay that you see to the right of me here. We're going to start out at Bagram here and we're going to head down this valley. An Army dust-off team is summoned to a forward operating base to pick up injured. The two medevac Blackhawks will fly 100 miles over a harsh Taliban-controlled landscape. The door gunner always looking for flashes from below. If they take fire, the crews know they have backup. We don't do this mission alone. We have uh, attack helicopters and scout helicopters that will go in and clear the LZ before we get in there. We have had to fight our way into those patients to try and secure at least an area at a period short enough to where we can get in, get the patient, and get out. That always doesn't work out. Thus, why five helicopters have taken rounds. It's especially hard when the war touches you personally, as it did when word of an Iraq casualty hit home. He had skull fractures, he had fractured ribs, um, he had both of his legs were broken, uh, both of his arms, he'd had tourniquets on his arms because when it rolled over it crushed both his arms, he was bleeding out, he was hemorrhaging. The injured soldier was the godson of her fiance, David Pond, and they both knew it didn't look good. Being the nurse that I am, I thought of all the potential complications, and I thought, I I don't know if he's going to make it. And I thought, how am I going to tell Dave? Honey, I, I don't think he's going to make it. He survived, was airlifted to Germany. After a long recovery, he now counsels fellow soldiers. 
The patients are fragile. It is not uncommon to have three double amputees on a flight out of Bagram, up to Germany. A quadruple amputee was recently flown out. Their sacrifice is saluted by the ground crews. In the din of jet engines and howling wind, they are applauded aboard. It is crisply and beautifully choreographed. The idea here is to get this aircraft off the ground as quickly and in as stealthy a way as possible to get these patients away from hostile airspace. It's 2 o'clock in the morning here in Afghanistan. We'll be wheels up in a matter of an hour. During the Vietnam conflict, it took an average of 45 days for an injured soldier to be transported from the theater of operations back to the continental United States. A soldier wounded today in Afghanistan or Iraq could arrive at a level four trauma center in Landstuhl, Germany in as few as 12 hours. Back on the flight line at C-17, the state-of-the-art troop transport is prepped for the flight back to Germany. The flight's delayed for a short time. There are concerns one of the severely injured patients has taken a bad turn, but he's stabilized, and the CCAT team, a storied three-person critical care unit, checks his vitals. A flight nurse who has flown aeromedical for nearly a quarter of a century will never take her eyes off that severely injured medic who's now on life support. She has a simple formula for critical care. Treat them the way their mom would want them to be treated. For nearly 70 years, through generations of aircraft, this has been the way home for wounded American heroes. It is the aircraft you never want to be on, but if you're hurt, it's the only place you want to be. So why do you do this? This is my part, this is my part. I was raised to be very patriotic, so I joined the military, and this is, this is what I do to contribute. I am serving my country and taking care of these young men and women. They're taking bullets for me. They're getting blown up for me for my freedoms. They're out on the front line. The least I can do is train the folks underneath me and we're gonna take care of those men and women and make sure they're okay. Sometimes it's, uh, it, it, hurts, it hurts a lot to, uh, to not be able to save those soldiers. But every mission is, is a new mission. And that's the way we focus on it, is every day is a new day and we do what we can to save. We save those who we can and we try like hell for those we couldn't. So there's a couple things I would point out, and I'll take a few questions, is uh, the CCAT team is a critical air transport team, usually a doc, a nurse, and a respiratory therapist. So one of them, they get um, three staff for one patient, and those patients are usually very, very ill. So they're usually the last on the aircraft and the first off. So uh, as you can tell, you can get very crowded, very, you know, um, you got sucked in sometimes, but move to get around the aircraft and move around. So. Um, in a nutshell, that's about it. The tactical flying, you saw the lights on the aircraft coming into the Afghanistan. Um, the lights go out the aircraft, and uh, you dive to land it, and then when you take off, it's like a pull up. So it's a lot of G-forces, whatever. So I uh, haven't been sick yet, but there were a few times. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's been an interesting experience. I'm about a year and a half from retiring out of it, but it has been a good experience for me. And, uh, so it gives you an idea of kind of what's going on. On TV, there's, some, there's a show called Combat Rescue. So it's, it talks about those helicopters going out and getting those uh, M3 guys, the Marines, that have been shot. One goes up, and you talked about it. Um, the other one goes in for security. If they need to fire, they will. But the med you know, they land the helicopter, and the pilots are vulnerable. They're sitting there on the ground. And the medics, the paramedics, um, need to run out and get the, get the aircraft, or get the wounded and bring them back on. So that's a very intense show. Um, some people don't like it. It's, uh, but it's young people doing very uh, risky um, things, but they're proud of their what they do. And um, like I said, my boss right there, it's uh, the least we can do to bring them home. And, and, uh, and that's about it. Any questions about the pro we just saw? Or no, he, he mentioned that. Like, I think it was just a term you used to in and out. And, um, Everything's about speed, and uh, it kind it's kind of organized chaos. You've heard that term before, getting people in and out, because you know, in elements, it's raining, snowing. You know, it'd be hot where I left Qatar, go, it'd be rainy, and cool up in Germany, and then we go to Afghanistan, it'd be snowing. So that just all this weather at us, and uh, you get you know, tripping hazards and, and things like that. So um, I think that's it. That's all I have. I think Carrie has some giveaways.
Yes, yes. It's kind of where I was at, yes, like some of those people, uh, patients were really bad. And they would somehow, Germany is the big hub. Ramstein, Germany is where the, like the neurosurgeons, there's, there's trauma teams in Afghanistan, but if they can stabilize and ship to Ramstein, that's where the big hospital is. Uh, and uh, um, that's where we'd take them. So I had friends, and when, they, when you mobilize, you get, kind of get scattered out. And uh, so I had friends in Afghanistan and Germany, and a lot of times that Germany to Afghanistan uh, had a lot more CCAT teams that when, you know, when they're really bad, CCAT was stationed between, <coughs> excuse me, Germany and Afghanistan. I was down in the bottom. So if you had, you know, there's guys that get hernias, um, strange infections, you know, whatever, they would come to where I was. And then, you know, we tried to get like 20, 25 patients rounded up. There's not a whole lot of room in this facility. So they need a bed if they're staying there. And then on usually Sunday night, we would load up and go to Germany and like I said, pain control, run some antibiotics if you need to, or make sure they're, you know, some are self-medicating, so they, you know, we make sure they're educated. Um, there's all, a lot happens, and uh, like I said, that team thing comes in, eyes and ears watching, and, uh, you know, mental health is the other thing. We didn't have to use um, restraints, but we have them in case we have to. And once you're in the air, you know, the, the nurse is in charge of the medical, so we can have a, something would come up, we have guidelines, but some strange question we might have, we can get a, a flight surgeon doctor on the um, phone and, and run it, you know, signs and symptoms we need, because we keep medication on board with us, so we carry a lot. They will, um, if it's a combatant of some sort, and you know, they're talking on the military side, if that person is, uh, they have information or something that we need, they will bring those people in uh, for surgery to save them. And even children, you know, you hear about the children walking in IEDs and things. They, uh, in that show, this combat rescue that's on TV, I don't know if it's over, I haven't seen it for a while, but uh, it's like a seven, eight part series. It shows them airbagging children that are just out playing you know, and these, some of these countries are just, there's a lot of ordinance out there that, you know, just laying out there. So, but yes, they would get the calls and uh, bring them back in. And that's, in, in this show I was talking about uh, combat rescue, it weighs heavy on those young guys because they're a lot of times going out and they're putting their life on the line and they're seeing this other thing and bringing them back. So it's, it's intense. So I didn't have to do helicopter stuff. I'm not, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think I'd be good on that. Um, they're when they're small, but they uh, but they get back to the, the flight line, and then the planes come in and pick up, pick them up. So, all right. Well, it's almost in there. Thank you. So we're do it. Hiram Philo. <laughs> All right, we know where to find him. We can give him he went to work. Yeah. Good for him. Okay. Ruby, $25 for Ruby here. Laura Ogden. Jolene F. Camp. All right. <laughs> well, that's all I have. If um, there's one more slide, but if somebody wants to email me, have any questions, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to you know discuss, talk, have any questions. Once you leave here, just give me a buzz. Cath lab usually, and I float around to <laughs> two south sometimes. So that's all I have. Thank you. 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 So this is.